Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for our panel today. My name is Colleen Carroll, and I'm a content publishing coordinator at Nexus Marketing and your moderator for today's session. Our topic today is adding up nonprofit financial best practices, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. But as usual, before we jump in and get started, I do have a few quick logistics to cover. NX Unite is made in partnership with Nexus Marketing, and the NX Unite mission is to make introductions that lead to lasting relationships and serve as a hub for connection in the mission-driven sector. As you saw in our video, on NX Unite, you can find upcoming industry events, suggested influencers to follow, trusted solutions, cause-driven podcasts, and of course, panels with experts such as these lovely folks here with me today. Today's hour-long panel will include time both for questions curated by my team and questions from you all, our wonderful audience. So at any time during the panel session, please feel free to start submitting your questions either via the chat or via the questions tab, and we'll take as much time in the second half to address as many as we possibly can. So again, that second half of the session will be entirely dedicated to your thoughts. We did have a number of questions submitted with registration, which is fantastic, but we will give priority to our live audience questions. So submit those questions early and we'll get to them as many as we can. All right. I did also want to mention that if you're having any technical difficulties, please let us know via the chat. My colleague Anton is under the team NX Unite username and will do his best to assist. So give a little holler in the chat. Let us know what's happening and we'll try to figure out how to get you back on and enjoying the session as quickly as possible. This session is also being recorded. So if you get to the end and the insight you heard was just so fantastic that you need to hear it a second time right away, that's wonderful news. It's going to automatically be in your email inbox at the end of the session. Give it a few minutes after we wrap up and that recording will be there. It will also continue to be accessible on the NX Unite website on the on-demand panel section. So if you have any friends in the industry who you're like, can't believe they missed it, that session was perfect for them, please feel free to share that same registration page that you you use to sign up and they'll be able to access the recording. Finally, before I introduce today's panelists, I do want to give a big thank you to our audience, uh, our live audience who is already very cheerful in the chat, letting us know where they're calling in from, as well as those watching the recording, whether that's tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Really hope you enjoy this session and get something out of it. And also hope that if you are joining us live, you'll submit those questions so we can address the topics most relevant to you and your team. All right, I'm going to jump in with some introductions. And first, I'd like to introduce Brian Haney, founder and CEO at The Haney Company. Brian is a certified association executive specializing in insurance and financial solutions for associations and privately owned businesses. Founder of his firm, The Haney Company, he is passionate about educating and empowering consumers to achieve financial success. Brian is a national speaker, author, podcast host, and mentor, operating an independent family-owned practice with his father, Alan, and brother, Scott, outside of Washington. Washington, D.C. As an 18-year financial industry veteran, Brian has had the privilege of speaking on a variety of topics to a variety of audiences and enjoys the opportunity to tailor a message to his listeners. So glad you could join us today, Brian. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a thrill to be here. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you. Also here with us today is Stephen King, founder and CEO at Growth Force. A highly energetic and motivational business leader, entrepreneur, and speaker, Stephen has a passion for helping businesses and nonprofits reach their growth potential. Regarded as a top accounting industry thought leader and founder of the first company to deliver accounting over the internet, he now serves as founder and CEO of Growth Force. His ability to visualize the future of accounting and assemble high, a high quality, highly qualified and motivated team has led Growth Force to become one of the nation's largest cloud-based bookkeeping, accounting, and comptroller services. Stevens worked with Fortune 100 companies, Tiny Mom and Pops. He's been an executive at a $4 billion company and a fundraiser at a nonprofit, all of which have given him a wealth of knowledge and insights into the accounting industry. So glad you could be here, Stephen. Great to be here. Thanks, Colleen, for having me. All right, I do want to recognize that we were supposed to have a third panelist, Greg McRae, president and CEO at Foundation Group. Unfortunately, they're having some technical issues on their end, are no longer able to join, uh, but we will try to get Brett, Greg on a future panel as I'm sure he has some amazing insight. And there's a small chance that he may log on a little bit late, so we might get him, but otherwise we'll get him on a future panel. All right, we are going to jump in and get started. And Brian, I'm gonna have you start us off with our first question. What are some best practices for financial management in the nonprofit sector and how can organizations implement them effectively? 
Such a great question, Colleen. Thanks so much. Um, and, and I'm actually probably going to be more excited to hear uh, Stephen's answer with all the technical knowledge that he has. Um, the things that I think we've seen uh, that are, are you know, somewhat uniform, I think, across the nonprofit sector are, are having really good systems. You know, I think uh, obviously in a digital marketplace, you have to have the right tech stack to be effective. Uh, to track information, to have the data that you need, uh, and to be able to then take advantage of using that data so that way it can be informative. Um, and it's, you know, it, having challenging systems, outdated systems, or things that just don't work and make, you know, take up more time, energy, effort, and resources and manpower. I think for profit, nonprofit, that's just a bad setup to begin with. So, really examining the technology that you are going to utilize specific to financial management, but I think it goes beyond that personnel operations. Um, and so, you know, it, it, they all do need to, to be in as much harmony and synchronicity, I think, as possible. I think another, and this is probably an understated best practice because it probably doesn't stand out too much when we think about these things, but have really good partners. Um, you know, who you work with matters, who you select, um, you know, you're not going to have an in-house everything, regardless of how big you are. And even if you do happen to have an in-house everything, it's it's always important to have, you know, key constituents, contracted relationships, legal, financial, accounting, you name it. Uh, and it matters. Your broker matters. Your insurance professional matters. Any advisors and so just really um, finding those relationships that can help give you that disinterested third party expert advice, guidance, framework, um, be that voice to, to bounce things off of really good partners invest, not just in delivering their services and solutions, but invest in you as an organization. They buy into your mission and your vision and really want to help you achieve success in whatever domain that you're in. So that's how I define the partnership. It goes beyond whatever your contract is with them. Um, and I think the last thing, and I don't know that that this maybe stands out as a best practice, but, but from what we've seen with the organizations that really excel, that your finances, your financials tell a story. And so I think that that's probably going to theme and a theme of the rest of this conversation, I imagine. But what story are you telling when it comes to your financials? And if you've never told a story of your financials before, maybe that's where you're going to want to start. Even same question over to you. Any thoughts on best practices for financial management in the nonprofit sector and implementing them effectively? Yeah, I'd love to build on what Brian said. You know. I come at it from a very unique perspective. I, I spent seven years at Ernst & Young, right? One of the largest accounting firms serving, serving the Fortune 100 companies, and then got an opportunity at age 29 to be the CFO of Amnesty International USA. So now I'm dropped into a, you know, a $20 million nonprofit running fundraising, finance, IT, HR, all the non-human rights related stuff. And it was right after Bruce Springsteen and U2 and Sting helped Amnesty grow 300% because MTV put us on the map. And so what I learned was that a nonprofit is harder to run than a for-profit. There are full, fewer levers to pull. You can't, if you need to bring in revenue, you can't just, uh, you know, uh, hire a salesperson or do a podcast or, you know, Go out and, and do a webinar. You've got to rely on your donors or your foundations or your, 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 your programs to help be sellable. And a nonprofit needs to be run like a well-run for-profit. The only difference is you reinvest the profits back into the mission. And because it's harder to run a nonprofit, it's even more important that you have data at your fingertips. One of the things that I see in terms of best practices for financial management in the nonprofit. And one of the areas that when we sign on new nonprofit clients, they, that's one of the first conversations we have is in a for-profit, you can see the cost of your services. The, the service businesses and nonprofits have something important in common. Labor, people, is 70 to 80% of the expenses. The single biggest expense we all have is the people. 
And if you've got a financial report, an, in, an income statement, a statement of activities that says down in alphabetical order under the P's payroll expense or salaries and wages, and your 70 to 80% of your expenses are showing up in two or three accounts, you can't make decisions based on data. And so what we recommend in order to, to really have an effective uh, uh, fundraising program, as well as financial reporting for each program manager, you have to take the cost of the people who are working on your programs, who are furthering your mission through the services that you offer, and you have to move them above the line. What that means is above your gross profit line. And nonprofits say to me, it's like, we're not, we're a nonprofit. We don't want gross profit. Yeah, I get that. The label's a little misleading. But if you don't separate out that direct labor into your cost of services and see what it really costs you, you're going to struggle to figure out how many how many people do I need to hire? How much money do I need to raise? What does it really cost us? So I, I work with an organization called the Village Centers in Texas, and they have uh, uh, their founder. They were founder led. They've just moved to professionally run. They've hired a an MBA from Rice, Christy Conrad, as their executive director. And the founder, Kim Brusatori, was like every founder, wanting to do everything possible to serve adults with learning disabilities. The problem is there's not enough money to do everything you could possibly do. And so how do you make decisions about which programs get your limited resources? You look at the ones that help you further the mission the most. And the only way you can do that is see which ones, what does it cost you to deliver your services and be able to evaluate what's the benefit, the return on investment, the tangible result of a donor's contribution by looking at the cost to deliver each service. And that allowed us to make decisions and say, here's, here's what we can afford, these six programs, and here's the two that we can't because we could see what the return on investment was because we could separate out that labor cost. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. I'm going to stick with you for our next question, and it's a two-part one. So I'll, uh, if you want me to repeat it, let me know. But how can nonprofits align their financial decisions with their missions and values? As well as what are some top financial reports executive directors should be looking at to make decisions for their organization? I, I love this question. I just I think this is probably the most important and the most difficult one that executive directors and the program staff have. In order to align your spending with your mission, you got to look at which of your programs help you further your mission the most. We did a we have a webinar and an ebook on how to help you run better, grow faster, and raise more money. And the first step is evaluate each program against whether it helps you further your mission by serving more people increasing the quality of service to the people you already have, help do something that nobody else does, or help you raise more money. Because money has to be a factor in it. But programs should drive money, not money driving program. And by ranking each program based on which programs help you further the mission the most, it allows you to be able to make that stack ranking and draw that line and make the decisions about which ones don't you use. You know, we work with the Fort Bend Women's Shelter here in Houston, Texas. And Vita Goodell is the executive director, and we walked through this workshop that we've got in the webinar we did. And she said, you know, it's really interesting. If I start looking at my programs against which ones help further the mission the most, I'm going to look at our programs differently. Our board of directors thinks we're doing really well. We're very successful because our shelter with 86 beds is full every single night. But our mission is not to help house the homeless. Our mission is to break the cycle of homelessness and abuse in women in the greater Houston area. And there's a difference there. And so she realized quickly, the most important program we have is our vocational training program. Because if we can get somebody that first job, that's how you break the cycle of homelessness and abuse. So by putting that as the first program to, to help further your mission, the one that has the biggest impact, now it allows you to go in and say, okay, what resources do we need for that? 
I think the second step to align your financial decisions with your mission and your values is to then look at that stack ranking and compare it to the cost of the services. We talked before about the importance of moving that labor cost to each program. Now you can see, hey, the vocational training program requires these three people. We only have one on staff. And so Vita was able to go back to her donors and say, listen, you've supported our shelter. You've helped keep the shelter open and alive and vibrant. But now we realize we have another program that's even more important to our mission. And all of their donors said, yes, that's great. We would invest in a vocational training program because they showed that this is where the donors get them the, the highest return on investment, the greatest bang for their buck. So it starts with the stack ranking and then look at the economics. How much does it cost you per person served? And show that tangible results to the donor. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen. Brian, over to you. Any thoughts on how nonprofits can align their financial decisions with their missions and values? And what are some strategies for balancing financial sustainability with social impact? Well, because this would be a really short event if I just said ditto to everything that Stephen said. So um, I, I, I definitely want to try to build on that because, you know, everything that he was just describing is the critical element. And I think you know, really where we see probably there's a spectrum of, of how far along and how, I guess, developed this is conceptually and in practice, but really defining impact, you know, defining, I know that it, it kind of seems weird where in the nonprofit space, it, it, we don't necessarily sometimes think as granularly as maybe we need to about what that, you know, what that kind of output looks like and what our deliverables are and what the, you know, it's kind of like, well, we're, we're, we've got this big cause or this big issue that we're trying to make a, you know, significant dent in and everybody can connect to that on some level. But that's not always extremely tangible. And, and again, that's a harder story to try to tell when it comes to how's the, you know, first of all, what's it going to really cost to monetize that? Right. If you're really going to make this this massive difference, but maybe we're not there at that level. So how do we start small? How do we build? How do we create a success metrics and then the financial plan that's going to support that success metrics? Like Stephen was saying, having a very, very granular department by, de by department, even person by person, you know, assessment of, you know, cost ROI impact expense and really being able to see that for what it is both internally and then i think being able to have a way to explain that externally to constituents to parties to donors and all that that um you know the more you're able to not just have this talk that everybody feels good and connected to but back it up with a framework of data that people can even feel more confident about what you're doing and their part in that story i think that that's you know, that's a real game changer. Um, I think the other thing is to realize that, and this may be obvious, but there's a difference between want and need and hopes and reality. And I know that sounds really simplistic, but sometimes it is just that pragmatic, right? How do we really understand, you know, yes, we really want to do this, but maybe this is what we need to do first. How can we triage some of the things, the competing interests, the expenses, where do we need to, hey, we had a, a windfall this year in donations. What's going to be the best thing for us to do with that excess capital right now? Do we have a plan for that scenario? Maybe if we don't, then that's where we need to start, right? So I think that that's, you know, again, the more that you're able to define your mission, your vision, and your values, that makes that definition easier to carry through to all areas, to have all parties be more involved and, and see that more direct connection to, to furthering that mission. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if you struggle with that, it's always good to work with someone to, to really help. You know, it's a brand, it's a story, but it has to have a black and white element to it and it has to have the monetary component as well. Absolutely. Stephen, did you want to jump back in? Yeah, I think, I think Brian, you said a lot of things there. The numbers telling the story is like the theme here, right? You know, um, we work with, a, 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 a see, there's a number of organizations serving veterans here in the chat. Um, and thanks for putting the chat in. That makes it interesting when you guys ask questions. Wheelchairs for Warriors is an organization that builds wheelchairs that are custom to allow a vet 
and first respond responders to be able to live the life that they had before they were injured. And so they're very custom wheelchairs and they were struggling with trying to raise money. And when, when you, the society of fundraising executives says, if you can show the donor, the tangible result of the gift, tell your story through the numbers, as Brian says, you're going to raise more money. They said their studies show you're going to raise more frequent giving and higher average gifts. And so what Wheelchairs for Warriors was able to do is to look at the cost of their adaptive living programs, divide it by the number of, uh, the, take the cost of the programs divided by the number of wheelchairs that they create and come up with an average cost per wheelchair. And it costs $24,000 to build one wheelchair. And these are special wheelchairs. Like if somebody was an Olympic, you know, archer, then that, that chair is, is designed to help them be an, uh, an archer. Or if they want to go into a deer blind in West Texas, you know, their, their wheelchair is going to have treads to get them up into the, the hill country. Well, once they were able to show the donors what their contribution gives, they not only were able to get larger gifts, like Moody Foundation is one of their biggest funders and moody has a very high bar in order to be able to be qualified to get a grant but because they could show what would be done if, with the grant and then they did a good job of stewardship and actually showing the donors how the money was spent telling the stories sharing the emotions of the impact on souls on lives of vets they've had tremendous success. So, you know, that telling of the story with your numbers is really critical. And, and how they're, everybody's looking for a, a place to, to, that's, that's um, responsible with the cash that can be trusted, but will have an emotional impact. So I think that telling the story is with the numbers and how it changed someone's life. That's, you know, the big thing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, very quickly, I wanted to let our audience know that we did have a poll go live. We asked, do you feel like your nonprofit's current financial decisions align with your mission and values? Uh, if you want to fill that out still, please feel free to. And I am going to encourage you all to submit questions. We want to tailor this conversation to you. I know a few have already come in, but keep them coming. And that second half, we will dedicate to your questions. Um, very quickly checking in on the poll, I see that 55% of you have said that sort of your values align with your mission, but it could be better. 38% yes, we've worked hard on it. Congratulations, that is awesome. And 8% not as well as we liked. I don't think those numbers added up because I think someone voted as I was going through, but it gets the idea. So for those of you who are in the sort of or not as well as we'd like category, I hope those answers were helpful. Brian, I'm going to have you start us off with our next question. What are some common financial challenges that nonprofits face and how can organizations overcome them to achieve their goals? Well, again, Stephen said it really well that it's it's much harder to run a nonprofit than a for profit. I think probably I would say one of the largest challenges is uneven cash flow. You know, you just you, you don't have the same amount coming in all 12 months of the year. Now, some organizations might have less kind of delta on a month over month basis than others, but I think the reality is we all can understand that, that you know, while we might have certain times when we have a lot coming in and, and then other times when we don't, a lot of times those fixed expenses don't also line up with when the revenue comes in. So just recognizing that you have to be very, very uh, systematic in how you're going to approach that um, and, and create a good plan and a framework to address that. Uh, so that way, you know, you're optimizing that revenue over, you know, a 12 month period of time. I know a couple of organizations we work with literally get 98% of their revenue in 45 days. I mean, it's incredible. I, I, I And again, you know, the for-profit model, like I, I, I don't understand that component because it doesn't really you know, exist in, in another, in another domain. So it's just, it's impressive. How do you then take 45 days worth of money and make sure that it's, it's spent wisely towards the mission, but also the rest of the fixed costs, expenses, the personnel, et cetera. And I, I really do love the, the examples and the granularity that Stephen gave in terms of connecting things to the personnel. 
And I've seen some really great examples in the clients that I know we've worked with where, you know, they they have even in the job description and the and kind of each person that works for their organization isn't just connected to what they need to do functionally, but they're also connected to the finances or at least to the element of the finances that you know should be in their purview. So the more that every member of the team recognizes that there is something that they're doing to contribute to the overall bigger picture, not just the vision and the part that we can feel good about, but the monetary component as well, then those teams operate better and more effectively. When they, when they have good dashboards of progress and everyone can kind of see that. So I think that that's, you know, the, the certainly managing cash flow that's uneven is a big challenge. And I think the other one was one we just touched on, right? The lack of vision and strategy that's meant to guide us more effectively. You know, sometimes you tell kind of the high level story and we can kind of peer into the future and all get really excited about what we are trying to accomplish. But if you don't get that down on a very fundamental day by day or, you know, what are we gonna do in the next six, 18, 24, 36 months, then that can be a real challenge. That's a challenge to turn around and tell a board, hey, we all agree what we're trying to do, but if I'm not able to really give you a good story and a plan, that a roadmap from today till 18 months from now that shows how we're gonna get there, then I think that that's the other disconnect that, that people can run into. And so being able to address both of those and understand that you need to have a strategy for all of that, I think is a, is a key el healthy element towards moving you in the right direction. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian. Stephen, thoughts on common financial challenges? I would love to reiterate what Brian just said about cash flow, right? That is one of the biggest reasons why nonprofits are harder to run. That seasonality is you don't see that in for profits. And so that's why, you know, as a as a fundraiser, we put so much energy into building sustainer programs, the monthly giving programs. You know, what's really great is you can take the sustainer programs, the, the best practices around to actually build a campaign around it and create a group. At Amnesty International, we called it Partners for Conscience. And it really was the groups that sustained us, that you know in August, when it's the deep dark of the summer, right? You, your gala isn't going to happen for another two or three months. The spring golf outing or the poker tournament, whatever you did in the springtime or the spring appeal has been spent. But by having that steady monthly giving program, you really ensure that you can make payroll in the hardest days. And so what we recommend is a simple technique to, to, to increase your giving by 20% is to go to your donors. Let's say somebody's giving you $1,000 at the end of each year. So, and right now is a great time to do it, right? In the spring and drop the last zero. So a thousand becomes a hundred and ask your donors to give a hundred dollars every month and make it easy for them. Use it an automatic ACH debit to their bank account and not the credit card, by the way. I don't recommend credit cards because you're going to end up chasing down donors because those credit card numbers change. But you can ACH for free. QuickBooks has got some great services to automate billing and collection. But what that also does is it allows you every month to tell your story with your numbers, right? So if you've got you know, uh, in Fort Bend, uh, sorry, in, in War Wheelchairs for Warriors, we just met this week and they've got a, another program for donated wheelchairs where they can refurbish and get that cost down to $12,000 a month. And they're going to ask people to give $100, uh, sorry, to give $1,000 a month and pay for one wheelchair every year. Or if you can only give $100 a month, bundle you along with 10 other people so that the 10 of you are helping with build one wheelchair. And then every month, send them a cultivation mailer with the acknowledgement. You gave me a hundred dollars this month. Thank you. Let me show you a picture of, of, you know, our, our vet who is, who is using this to compete as an archer or, you know, the village learning center has stories where they say, let me show you how we took our adults with learning disabilities to their job through on the bus and your hundred dollar a month contribution pays for three people on the bus. That will lift, not only do you get a 20% increase, because instead of getting $1,000, you get 12 $100 gifts, you get $1,200, but it also connects you with your donors. It gives you an opportunity to increase the additional asks. And 
you know, to me, that cash flow is one of the single biggest problems. The monthly giving program really helps it. Yeah, and I, I just want to, you know, what Steve was saying also reminded me, and I think that it's, I'm going to define this as the solution, but revenue diversity. And this is, again, where, you know, the for-profit world can teach the nonprofit world quite a bit because it's that entrepreneurial mindset that tends to come to play to help address that in a more for-profit dynamic that sometimes nonprofits struggle just to see beyond one or two ways to bring in revenue or generate revenue and find donors. So really, you know, encouraging and finding a way to think outside the box and recognize that there are a lot of ways to bring money in, even if it's maybe the same target audience, but like we're just describing different ways that you can get them to give, um, find, making giving easier. Maybe in, if you have a lot of personal donors, can you attract corporate donors? Maybe somebody doesn't want to write a check as a company, but maybe they're willing to sponsor an event or to be more visible in front of the, the rest of the organization. So there's just there's a lot of ways that if you're you know, you can take a few steps outside your traditional lines to try to find new ways to cultivate revenue again to get that diversity. So that way, you know, you're not one of those organizations that makes 98 percent of their revenue in 45 days and then has to worry about the other, you know, 320. Um, you know, that's that's a big, big element. You, Brian, you mentioned something earlier that I think was really important, which was key performance indicators or KPIs. I know there's a question in the chat about, you know, how do you get the board to see if you're moving away from the mission or the purpose? I think board reporting is something that's really worth spending a minute on here because this is what most we know when but when people come to us to be the outsourced accounting department for their nonprofit, the number one reason they're coming to us is because the job of the executive director is number one, to make the board happy and two, to raise money. And those are two hard jobs. In addition then to number three, which is the job, right? Managing the people, getting the programs out and, and making sure that it all comes together. And the challenge with board reports is but you know, what I see typical CPAs, and I'm a CPA, so I, I, I love my profession, but you know, the, the statement of financial position and the statement of activities, you know, the income statement and the balance sheet, to use for-profit language, is it's not designed to be actionable. It's designed for compliance, right? It's designed for the IRS to make sure the 990 is right. It's designed for the banks to make sure that they know when they give you money that you can pay it back. And when you give a PL or a statement of financial activities by month to the board, and you have all the line items with the actuals and the budget showing side by side, which is what almost everybody starts out with, your board's going to start looking for reasons to justify their existence for volunteering an hour and a half of their time. And so they start looking for questions they can ask. Why was your technology expense $5,000 over budget? Do we have a problem with our server? Now, all of a sudden, you're in tactics. And what, what we recommend is have an organizational scorecard that shows the, the most important drivers of the organization, starting with revenue. What is the trends of the revenue? Earned revenue separated from development revenue. What is the cost of the program? So you can see the real management of the, of the financials. You, you know, we're not trying to get away from that. But instead of giving them line item details, show them directional trends. Show them where, where are you against budget on a graph. And, and that's the key performance indicators that Brian's talking about. And then what you want to do is, what are the drivers of success? You know, in the village centers, their home community services is a big part of their program. So we have a chart that will talk about how many people are being served in there. How many incidences do we have? Do we have any legal issues? Do we have any investments that need to be made? But focus, make sure that when you're delivering a report to your board, it's a high level strategic board report, not just what the CPA delivers because you're, you're going to get the board down into the weeds. You know, that's, I, I'm so glad you, you, you answered that question now, and I know we're, we're probably staying on this one a little bit longer, but I think this is really good, Colleen. Um, I, I'm very proud to be on the national board for uh, Financial Industry Association, NAFA, and I can, I can absolutely say I continue to have a very wonderful experience as, as a 
volunteer board member because they present information in exactly the way Stephen described. Each department has it a part of the story that's being told. Um, and, you know, so every board member isn't just presented with the numbers. Now, yeah, I, I have a few designations. I probably know more than the average financial professional about how to read the numbers, but that's not really the point. The point is that I don't get them and then am kind of implied that I need to know how to interpret that. I get the story. It's very transparent uh, and, and it really allows me to, to connect to what I'm seeing, but also it heads off a lot of potential questions or concerns because if there's you know, something in the performance that you know, would show up on one of the, you know, the profit and loss and, and the statement of cash flows, there's something that you know, I'd be like, I don't understand this. They've already kind of addressed that in the way that it's been presented. So that way I don't have to try to interpret it. I don't have to go out there and uh, you know, hypothesize in my own mind about how we're falling apart financially. Um, and so you know, it, it, in, in very, very real life practical terms, it makes all the difference. But sometimes again, organizations, I think assume board members maybe know more than they do. And I always, my wife says this to me all the time, you know, try to communicate and present things to me as if I'm in kindergarten. Make yeah. it real simple. Don't presume anything. And and if if somebody understands it, they'll be able to kind of move you along. But at least that way you're not, you know, you're not kind of walking into the door and hoping people can make their own assumptions because everybody brings their own assumptions to the table. Some might be good, some not so good. And so that's just a much more effective way, I think, to have that interaction and then when the board has that experience, those board members walk away as champions of the organization, which you obviously want them to be, but they feel so much better now because they, they've been told a more compelling story. It's so interesting you say all that. You know, the same thing is true with your program managers. To the extent that, you know, most 88% of nonprofits are using QuickBooks, QuickBooks Online. And QuickBooks has, has you know, the, is the giant of the marketplace because there's so much power in there. And what I love about QuickBooks Online more than anything else is the ability to put that same kind of financial intelligence into the hands of the program managers. And the secret here, one of the, one of the tricks in getting accurate, timely information at the lowest cost is if you give access to your program managers, give them access to their budget for their program, and show them their actual spending against that program, number one, it makes it easier for them to decide, can I afford to spend the money on this outing or this bus or this person? But number two, your numbers are going to be right because the program manager can say, hey, this was charged to my budget. Why, why are you hitting my budget with that? And now all of a sudden, you don't have to worry about passing through an audit because you got it fixed every single month. And when you have that strategic information in the hands of the decision makers, the program managers, that makes it easier for the executive director to have confidence in their numbers. And then when you give it to the board, you know it's right. So I just want to build on that for Brian. Thank you both. You both get gold stars. You answered both the audience questions because I think this also talks a little bit about retaining good board members, which was our second question, is giving enough information. Um, Brian, I'll have you start us off with our next one uh, that is kind of our pre-prepared questions that you received in advance. Um, I think we've touched on it a little bit, so I'm not, I'm not sure we need to go too much further into it, but what are some key considerations for nonprofit financial reporting and transparency? How can organizations communicate their financial information effectively to stakeholders? and how can you show the donors the ROI of their gift? Yeah, I mean, this one, I, I think we can we can run through pretty quickly because we've talked about it. I, I'll i say some of the obvious. Fill out all the forms the IRS tells you to. Right? <laughs> Just make sure you're doing that, right? So if you're not doing that, then start there. Um, and then just, you know, what, more of what we've talked about, you know, not just having the forms, the data, but being able to use it to tell the right stories to the right audiences. And I'm, I'm so glad Stephen gave real good description and context of what we were talking about. When everybody has a stake, everything operates better because you've empowered all of the members of your team and your board when you're telling them things the most effective way. They're more empowered now with their stake 
and it just it you know it it makes for a better overall experience that then ultimately does show up in the bottom line because when you have we you know when all members of the team all employees and and even even those that might be volunteer but might be somewhat very connected to revenue elements can be able to see this the cohesion and the unity you know you're just going to have a better overall experience versus sometimes we see that breakdown where you know the the authority and the information is is kind of held with a few people and then a lot of other people are disconnected to that and that's just never never effective so you know fill out what you need to tell the right stories to the right audiences empower people to be able to cheer you on uh and that's you know a, a great recipe for success yeah i completely agree with that i think one of the big trends that we're seeing in the nonprofit world today is a shift and focus to outcome driven reporting, looking at what are the, you know, as we said earlier, what are the outcomes that further your mission the most? And then when you tell your story to the board, to the investor, to your donors, to your, even your staff, if you focus on what are the outcomes, then everything else falls in line. You're going to be able to make sure, I think there was one of the other questions here is, you know, how do you make sure that the, the board knows if you're moving away from the mission and the purpose? If you're reporting on our, what outcomes are you creating, that allows you to be able to make sure that your conversations are focused on, are we investing in the right programs? Are we getting the biggest return on investment for our mission? for Fort Bend Women's Shelter, not to house the homeless, but to break the cycle of homelessness and abuse. And that helps organizations communicate their financial information to all the stakeholders. And I think that outcome-driven movement, the United Way is do making a big push for this over the last couple of years. You know, to me, this is, this is where we all need to be. And donors want that. No, I... I mean, geez, you know, most of you probably think we were super prepared in advance, but everything is just, you know, I mean, that was perfect. So I, I want to say this, the numbers aren't the story. The story is the story told based on impact, based on what Stephen was just talking about. What the numbers do is they either support, encourage, and reinforce a well-told story or they can detract from it or cause concern or minimally just a disconnect between the story and the financial element. So that's really what we're talking about, right? Let the story be well told to the right parties and the right audience and then find the best way for the financials to just be the rocket fuel to that story. That's when you get, you know, you're taken off into the stratosphere. Fantastic. Steven, another question for you. How can our nonprofits on the call ensure compliance with tax laws and regulations? And what are some tips for navigating the landscape that is nonprofit taxation? Brian said it at the top of the show, partner with people who really know what they're doing. You have to partner with people who just specialize in nonprofits. I had my own CPA firm. I was a tax guy. And the challenge I found was that unless you do taxes every single day of the year, the tax law changes so much every year that it's impossible for you to figure it out on your own, especially, you know, tax date was yesterday. So, you know, you can do your own taxes on TurboTax if you have a very simple W-2. But when you're trying to report on a 990, it's not just being in compliance with the IRS. All that data gets reported to the Charities Information Bureau, which ends up on GuideStar. And your numbers are telling a story through the tax return. One of the things that I see a lot of people mistake is, and Brian said it, fill out all the, 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 the pieces of the form, because if you explain, use that tax return as a selling tool, explain what your mission is, what your outcomes are, what is success. I think it's worth it to have a GuideStar uh, uh, account as if you're, the, if you're the CFO or the executive director of a nonprofit to go look up your account, because that's what the foundations are looking at. And then work backwards from there and say, okay, we're not showing the outcomes. We're not showing success. We're not showing the key metrics that we measure. And that's what your donors, the sophisticated donors anyway, are looking at. 
So I think you have to partner with somebody, you know, outsource anything that's not a core competency. That's what the, a well-run for-profit does, right? Outsourcing has exploded over the last 10 years. And, and in the last two years in particular, with the age of resignation and COVID, you can't find professionals. You can't afford, you know, $125,000 for a, a controller or a CFO. It's tough to do, can't, tough to find them because nobody went to graduate school or or spent five years to become a CPA to go get a $30,000 cut in salary. It's hard to find real experienced people. And so by, by outsourcing to somebody who specializes in nonprofits, you, you save money, but you turn the back office from a weakness into a strength. You know, instead of just struggling to get a board report and get that 990 done, now all of a sudden you, you have the data to tell that story and raise more money. Wonderful. Brian, over to you. Any thoughts on ensuring compliance with tax laws and regulations and in general navigating the nonprofit taxation process? Yeah, I mean, you know, Stephen already really covered all of that. We mentioned it before, obviously, getting getting all the forms done. I think uh, an area that we see that maybe isn't, you know, compliance in the external sense, but more kind of operationally compliant and, and what really good organizations do that maybe isn't always as seen. But I think that's really having really good personnel manuals, processes, having a real good internal, internally and operationally compliant organization, having a really good corporate ethos. You know, sometimes the, the nonprofit industry, when it's built around passion, there's, there's a high corresponding element of potential burnout, right? Because you work really, really, really hard on something that you're really passionate about. But sometimes organizations that don't have a really good culture, don't have a really good internal control and internal framework, don't retain these great passionate people long enough because the breakdown isn't in, in what they're doing out there in the marketplace. It's in how are we treating our people and how are we, you know, running a, a very good, thriving organization. So I think that that's the other part. Um, I wouldn't be a, a good insurance person if I didn't say take care of your risks really understand what risks you face. You can get sued in a lot of ways. You should know all of those ways. And then you should have a plan to address what might happen if X, Y, and Z played out. So don't just be blind to that. I'm not saying there's an insurance policy for everything, but there should be a risk, you know, a, a, an entire risk policy that you've gone through and you've done an evaluation. So that way you can protect yourself the way that you need to be protected. Thank you. All right. Um, unimaginably, we're almost at the end of the hour. This has flown by. So I actually have just one final question for each of you to make sure that we hear from you both a final time. And Brian, I'll have you start us off with it. What do you see as the future of nonprofit financial best practices and how can nonprofits get ahead today? Yeah, I think that there's probably two things. If I, you know, peer, peer into that crystal ball, um, I think we're going to see, hopefully, that divide between for-profit and non-profit start to, you know, I don't want to say go away entirely, but I think we're recognizing that really good practices financially and otherwise operationally, um, even just kind of branding, marketing, right, concepts that seem to just fit when you're trying to sell something and you have, you know, stockholders actually fit equally well when you're telling a vision-based mission story. So I think that, you know, just seeing that that dividing wall start to come down and, and, and the delta gets smaller. But then I also think, again, the same thing in terms of how do we really use technology, data, and, and you know, how do we optimize ourselves in a digital economy? We're, we're in the digital economy. We're not going back to carrier pigeons and horses and buggies. It's just, it's here to stay. So really good organizations of any type are gonna really recognize that technology should be an accelerant, not a crutch. And where you are on that spectrum really matters. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think. I think the big shift that I'm seeing across all of our nonprofits is a move from uh, founder led to professionally run. You know, there's a maturity, there's a life cycle of nonprofits exactly like there is a life cycle of, 
of, of for profits. And when you are when you are trying to become a more professionally run nonprofit, it means that you have you have to have a methodology to help you create the the, the data that you need at your fingertips in order to help make decisions that drive it. And, and what's interesting is we've studied this over 30 years. There's five big decisions that nonprofits have to make. You know, hiring and firing is the single biggest one. Which program should you stop? Which one should you start? Which one should you continue? You know, when you get to that higher level of, of decision making and you understand that, you know, this is what a professionally run organization looks like, it's easier actually then to be able to stay focused on the things that really matter. And for me, that's what I love about serving nonprofits is there's always a desire, a getting better agenda, we call it, right? We just, you know, raging incrementalism is my whole mindset. Every single month, you want to get a little bit better so that by the time you get to the end of the year, you can look back at the beginning and say, well, look how far we've come. I think the other thing is the well-run organization use their numbers to tell a story. They show the donor the tangible result of their gift. And if you can do that, if you can look at, just like an investor in a for-profit wants a return on investment, donors want to see a return on investment, a social consciousness return on their investment. And so to the extent that you can use your numbers to, to show that, you're going to raise more money and you're going to be a better run organization. Fantastic. With that, we have reached the end of our panel. I want to give a big thank you to you both. I know if we were in an in-person setting, there would be a round of applause. So just know that I'm sending that to you emotionally through the screen today. I do also want to give a big thank you to our audience, to our live audience for joining and engaging with our polls, as well as to those of you watching the recording. Really appreciate your time. Hope you gained something. Hope you could you learn something that's going to support the amazing work that you're already doing. And I also hope you will join us for future NX Unite panels. We have a ton of panels planned for this spring and summer related to the world of nonprofits, everything from donor recognition to nonprofit events, to acquiring and retaining Gen Z donors, to more financial panels. Please keep your eye out on the NX Unite website, the NX Unite LinkedIn, or you can even find me on LinkedIn to find sessions that may be relevant to you and your team. All right, that is it for me. Again, a huge thank you to you all. A big thank you to our panelists. And I hope you all have a nice rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you.